We're so pleased to have Daniel, who traveled quite a far way with his machine to get here. Um, Daniel is an artist and a PhD student studying visual neuroscience, and he is the steward of the do-it-yourself book community. And um, Charlie is the one who invited Daniel, so hello, Charlie. Um, so welcome, everybody, and I'll turn it over to Daniel. All right. Say a word. Yes. Um, I met Daniel at a conference in New York on Google Books and was struck by what he had to show and say in a way that put the question of the balance of uh, the force of law against the force of impeding technologies as a, as a way of thinking about the relationship between law and technology. And uh, that's a line that we are familiar with thinking about in some way with respect to music. What's the balance between the inability to get to it, which has slipped away to nothing, and the force of law in maintaining the idea of copyright? And what I was struck with with uh, Daniel was how he puts the same questions into your mind about books and does it in a way that's completely physical. And so I was just very impressed and eager to have him come and share what he had with Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I suspect a lot of what I'm going to say isn't news, um, but I, I and I'm, I'm going to do this with three. This talk is three parts. There's a background. There's a what we're doing now, and then there's a future. So, about a year ago today, I was searching Amazon for used copies of textbooks, um, and I, I couldn't afford these textbooks new, which is why I'm searching for them used. So, I'm on Amazon, and Amazon recommended to me some digital cameras, which you can see mounted back here. So these digital cameras, startlingly enough, were cheaper than the textbooks that I needed to buy. <laughs> so I did what I always do when I get in trouble. Um, I jumped in a dumpster, uh, grabbed a bunch of trash, and bodged together this book scanner. I did it in three days, uh, not because I'm some kind of exceptional engineer, but because I, ne I needed to return the book. So um, <laughs> now, in the end, I didn't, I didn't return the book, but there you go. So this type of scanner. Um, importantly, is much faster than flatbed scanners. It's, it's an order of magnitude faster than flatbed scanners. And because of the way it cradles the book in this V-shaped platen, it's very gentle. And so it's, it's got two, you know, two major advantages. The nearest commercial equivalent is $5,000, and the total cost of the one that I built was $300. Um, now, I show this to my friend Aaron Clark, and he wanted one immediately. And so I decided, you know, why not? So I grabbed my friend Noah, and Noah and I worked together um, sort of obsessively documenting the build of this model. So this is my second book scanner built just a short time after the first one. And in exchange, Aaron wrote a software program called Page Builder. Now, Page Builder was the first um, host processor for these things. So these scanners, you know, it's hardware. The cameras still take ordinary pictures, and you need to convert them into nice e-books. And so that was, our, that was our bargain. So building the scanner, I sort of I knew that I had a, an inkling that it was something important, so I obsessively documented this thing, right down to taking things out of the trash. And I produced a 79-step instructable with the help of this friend of mine, Noah Bicknell, um, which, which was shared on the website Instructables. Is everybody familiar? It's a website where you share plans and how to do things. And I entered it in the Epilogue Grand Challenge, which is a contest to win a laser cutter. Um, there were 93,000 views during the contest. I'm at 160,000 today, which puts it, I think, seventh or eighth most popular instructable on the site. And I won a laser cutter, which is a $10,000 giant printer, which you can feed plywood or plastic or other materials into. Um, and it will cut them out according to the artwork that you draw. So sort of somewhat hilariously, uh, here's the laser arriving at my workshop. By the way, this is now underwater. Um, and uh, you know, sort of giving it the big thumbs up. Sort of hilariously, after I after I got the laser, I also entered in a contest on Engadget.com to win a Kindle. And the contest was to use to make artwork to be laser etched on a Kindle. I also took the grand prize and got a Kindle, which I promptly sold. Um, <laughs> so winning winning gadgets isn't what this talk is about, though. Um, actually, what this talk is about is what happened after all this. So you know, this is sort of a. a three weeks to a month of stuff happening, just winning all these contests and having a great time. And all of a sudden, people from all over the world started contacting me, telling me their stories 
about why they needed book scanners. So in the Instructables comments first, there were some four or 500 comments from people who were showing up and saying, you know, I really need one of these. Thank you for sharing these plans. I never thought about doing it this way. Um, and these same people started building them immediately. So I think there were about 10 or 15 people right off the bat that were, were producing them. Um, some people were producing them within days of the original post. And they were sharing all these improvements back. So I mean, my design wasn't hard to improve on, right? It's made of trash. Uh, and they, they were sharing back these improvements and talking to me continuously. And the first guy to build a scanner was a math, uh, mathematician programmer named Rob. We founded this website, DIYBookScanner.org. So a little bit about the community. Uh, right now, the site, I think we have about 370 members, give or take. Um, we have about 3,000 3, some posts. And the first few people to sign up were two mechanical engineers two programmers and an intellectual property lawyer, which I found most amusing. And right now we have between 50 and 80 scanner builds that people have shared with us. I know that there are many, many more outside the forum because I continuously get email, people asking me questions about their scanners that, that they're just not sharing back. So just to give you an idea of what I mean, here's my first one. And here are some 40 randomly selected builds. That's Tom's build from the forum. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, it's just a, it's just a small selection. So there's the, the bigger question, like, who are these people and what are they doing, right? I mean, obviously, they're scanner builders. But our community now comprises digitization experts, librarians, book lovers of all stripes, people who've never handled soldering irons, and the print disabled. And you know, we've come a long way from the beginnings in a dumpster, right? But um, what we're doing is taking the mystery out of, out of book scanning. And we want to make all this stuff kind of not a mystery, make it free, make it open source, and, and make it accessible to anyone, especially the people who really need it. I'm going to tell you about them by telling you their stories. The first story is Rob, the guy that I found in the, the book scanner site with. So Rob has about, I think he said 3,000 or 4,000 science fiction paperbacks that's sort of coming out of every corner of his house, you know, bending every shelf. and. At, at every turn, and he wants to convert these books using his fair use rights to convert these books into bits and to be able to read them on his on his Kindle. And I think it's like a particularly fitting fate for science fiction. Um, but you know, this is also, uh, as, as Charles mentioned, it's it's the same battle we've been going through from wax reels to vinyl to cassettes to eight tracks to everything else. And it's I mean I, I'm sort of asking the question now, like when are we going to learn? to stop buying things in, in broken formats. So from there, uh, I'm going to tell my own story, which is the collapse of Menard Hall at NDSU. Uh, <laughs> the office in the bottom center of the collapse, as you can see, was my office. And all of my books were in there. They were boiled when the steam pipes opened up. And all of my stuff was crushed. And so it was actually, what's that? No, that's at home. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, um, I had digital copies of the most important ones that I had previously made. Wow. So, uh, away from the site founders, this guy in the top... Is that for real? That really happened? That really happened. <laughs> it happened after New York in December. Yeah, that's, that's really there right now. You can go up and... Yeah. Wow. So I, I work in the back of that building now in the uncollapsed portion. Had anybody into the building? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They have to fix it. <laughs> uh, you don't think it had anything to do with you, do you? <laughs> I'm starting to wonder. They, they weren't on to you. Well, no. <laughs> right. Digital books take a lot less space. So they can't That's right. My book now the books weigh less, right? So the building collapses less. Um, so the next case I'd like to talk about is a is a fellow named Tristan. So Tristan has these uh, light bulbs in his eyes, and Tristan has problems reading with his eyes. So he hears perfectly normally. He's a he's a mechanical engineering major but he has just some difficulty reading this way, an undiagnosed reading disorder. And Tristan has shown up and designed his own very innovative book scanner to have his computer read to him. So we have another user named, uh, I guess whose name I will not really say, is not really polite, but he's paraplegic. And he has gone repeatedly to a science fiction publisher asking for a digital copy of a particular series that he'd like to read again, which he also owns the physical books, by the way. And they've refused the possibility of ever producing a digital edition. So he asked his family to come to our forum and build a scanner so that he can read it again. Uh, on a little bit more positive note, we have people like Misty DeMeo, who's a digitization assistant at the County of Brant Public Library in Brant, Ontario. And she um, is using DIY book scanner technology in a library setting to kind of bootstrap her way 
to grants and better equipment, right? So there's no reason not to digitize right now. The equipment is good enough. And in fact, her scanner, let me see, is uh, actually a whiskey box and several uh, pieces of foam board. So you can see uh, the quality is phenomenal and the means are minimal. Uh, we have other people. I'm sorry, let me, let me say one more thing about libraries that I think is really interesting, right? I mean, libraries have preserved our books this far. We have all these books that libraries have been saving and preserving and keeping cataloged and carefully everything, and yet what's going to happen with the Google Books settlement or with other digitization efforts is that they're actually going to have to subscribe back to their own collections. So the same people who got us where we are are going to be forced to, to, to pay for doing that, essentially. And I think that's wrong. And I think that actually there are distributed models that we could use for scanning. One of the sort of dreams that's come up repeatedly in our forum is to have these cheap scanners at the library. And you can imagine, for example, paying your library fees by spending 10 minutes scanning a book, right? Or in, in exchange for a library card, if you're an out of area user, you could, uh, you could scan a book. Well, the beauty of it is the most desirable books would be scanned immediately. And you could also, I mean, for example, you could have your name inscribed in an ex libris plate or something in, in the cover of the digital edition, right? <coughs> Just a suggestion. So Francesco is another member. Um, who, actually, he did most of the scanning before he came to us, but he's, he's such an incredible user. So he, he scanned six Italian dictionaries in completion and made the full text corpus searchable online. So anybody interested in Italian language has full access to these uh, antiquated um, volumes now. Another one of our sort of Herculean members is this guy who calls himself Post Scan Grinder, and he has digitized no less than 36,000 pages of high school yearbooks in exchange for uh, the rights to put them online. But um, there's this question that's kind of coming up here, which is how do you know what to scan, and how, how do you know when you're scanning legally? Because a lot of people think that just the act of scanning is infringing, right? The, there's a project going on at Tulane University um, that sort of through a, a chance internet meeting, uh, DOI book scanner is in, uh, technology is enabling. So there's a guy named Ben Verratti who's a graduate student at Tulane working on this project called a Durationator. In the fullness of time, Durationator will be a tool where you enter any work and you can check its copyright Ooh. status. Tulane has a copy, as far as I know, a complete copy of the original renewal records, and which the first ones were destroyed by Katrina and they got a second copy on loan, and then they couldn't afford to build book scanners. So when they found us, they built custom book scanners for their volumes, and they're scanning them right now as a part of creating this tool that will enable people to more legally scan things. It's kind of a nice loop. But the, the project that's closest to what I think is, is the spirit of the DIY book scanner project, which is really people making technology their way to help themselves, is this man named Suryan Daru. So, He's one of the very first people to contact me on Instructables. He wrote me a private message and said, this is the first message I've sent to anybody on the internet. Um, I'm here in Indonesia, and we've had these floods, earthquakes, and uh, uh, tsunamis. Everything is, is terrible. And we have these handwritten books that document who owns what land and where. And when your house washes away, if you're not in this book, you don't have land. And he said, this is causing all kinds of unrest and problems. So. And he ended his message saying, I'm going to save up to buy cameras, but it'll take me six months. So I took up a donation, incidentally, with the first intellectual property lawyer to join my forum. We bought him a set of cameras and mailed them to Indonesia. He and his son, Oka, built a scanner using these two cameras and started scanning these books. And as far as I know, they're still scanning them right now, going around to different villages, essentially keeping the peace. These books are, as you can see, unsuitable for photocopying because much of it is handwritten. You know, normal techniques just don't work here but the DIY scanner does. So what I'd like to tell you, you know, it's, I, I've sort of given you the past, the, the ugly beginnings of the project, and now I'm telling you the present. And I think it's time to talk a little bit about the future and, and where this is going. I think where it's going is more important than where it's been. Um, there's, there's something really cool going on, which is that we're working with a guy sorry, uh, named Joseph Artsimovich, who's a Russian programmer uh, living in London, who wrote a program called ScanTailor for flatbed scanners. And we're currently working with, back and forth with him, although he's doing the majority of the work, to produce kind of the ultimate uh, scanning software for all V-shaped scanners, including the commercial ones, including you know all the variety in our form and everything else. And what this software does is ingests all the images and produces clean and, and perfect sort of PDFs. And I mean, this thing, it, it really is magic when you see the results it can work. And there's further magic going on here, which is that Rob and another member of the forum named Esdati, in conjunction with Joseph Artsimovich, 
have been developing what are called de-warping algorithms. So if your cameras aren't perfectly parallel or if there's some lens distortion or other problems in the image, you know, that's sort of not a good, uh, it's not a good way to read a book, right? These guys have been developing de-warping algorithms, and you're seeing one in action here, going from a curved scan to a flat scan using only the information available on the page. Now, the other thing is that the scan that went in here was just a photograph. You know, it wasn't this nice, clean text, right? It had all kinds of noise and everything. Here's another example. And this is totally open source, practically magic software that is, you know, is now sort of a part of this canon. So there's another end of this, which is the hardware front. Um, and I have the idea that, you know, not everybody wants to jump in a dumpster and build a book scanner, right? And not everybody even wants to, to build anything. And so, but we're at this really wonderful precipice in history. We're not only at the sort of the point where, you know, uh, metal type becomes malleable bits, but we're also at the point where 3D models can be instantiated in, in reality using rapid prototyping equipment. And I just have this little demo, which is my laser cut scanner. So this folds up and goes into uh, carry on luggage, and it works as follows. I've got Lawrence Lessig's remix book in here, by the way. Flip a page, press the button. The two cameras fire together, and we've captured two pages. And that's it. So that was cut by the laser cutter that I won because I view the laser. Um, let's see if this works. Yeah, I have a I have an animation here, which I guess I'll let play where you can see it folded up. Um, and so it, it's sort of this transformer book scanner. And uh, I built it specifically to take it on planes and, and go around, although it has its problems. So the next stage of this process, I, I, I built it in a, in a real hurry. Um, I was supposed to speak at the DS for Digitize conference in New York. Uh, James Groman kindly invited me there, um, and that's where I met Charles. And I did it in such a hurry that I had some hundred some files with random parts everywhere and all the mistakes that you make when making something like this. I've basically produced this scanner seven or eight times in the process of working out the details in my shop like a pit of cut plywood. And uh, what's happened is this guy, Dario de Moura, who works at the University of Brazil, showed up in the forum and had just sort of started creating a 3D model of the scanner from scratch because he wanted one. Since that time, uh, I gave him the original artwork and he spent I immense numbers of hours reworking the artwork and making it perfect. And we're now releasing it, as of today, under the GPL. So this scanner, now you'll be able to download these plans, take them to a laser cutting service, or use them on your own laser and produce your own laser sort of in an IKEA fashion. You just get this slot together thing. And that's Dario. I'm extremely, extremely proud. I hope Dario's watching. Uh, extremely, extremely happy and, and thankful for the work that he's done. So this sort of gets to, you know, even, even further into the future, right? Um, the dream, uh, one of the dreams, you know, Everything I've talked about is scanning, and that's because I believe that scanning is the first step in all these problems, right? If we want to talk about a future of digital books, we have a whole history of books that needs to be ingested and brought into the present. And in that way, what we're doing is methodical, right? In a way, it's short-sighted. All, all books being presently authored are, uh, are digital, right? But we're, we're talking about that first step of having good scanning equipment, and the idea is, like, if you wanted a scanner, you could, for example, print it out and have it wherever you are, and the software will just sort of accept these things and produce good books. And I think this is sort of best illustrated by the fact that we all have bookshelves, probably leaning bookshelves, and many of us have ebook readers, and there is no conduit between the two. In fact, the only legal option you have is to buy the books a second time, and that totally ignores your fair use rights. So. Again, as I said before, the other dream of this scanner is to see it as a sort of general purpose machine, like we see a copier now. Copiers are commonplace, and they have special status in libraries. And why not have a book scanner right next to it? But this is where I'm, I'm going to say something that's a little bit crazy, which is that we don't need to hurry, right? Right now, all the mistakes being made by Google and other companies is because they are rushing, rushing, rushing to create a market. They want to create a market that is unassailable, as once you have a market, it removes fair use rights and other reasons. I don't believe Google's out to, to destroy fair use or something, don't get me wrong. But this rush to create a market obviously ignores a lot of people, as I've said. And, and furthermore, you know, we can do this according to who needs what when. 
there are certain books that are much better digitized now than later. And we can move along this thing um, as necessary. The other thing is that, you know, I mean, and by the way, even if it took us 10 years, that's forever in internet years. Um, you know, not everything constitutes a market is a, is a big thing I want to say here. But the other thing is, you know, some things that are definitely not a market are politically unacceptable ideas. And there's a whole load of stuff that you definitely don't want stored in the cloud. You don't want library records created of it. And, and there are some things that are politically this way. And there are some things like porn, which saturates all technology and drives new technology that you also don't want to be creating records of. So I, it's, you know, there are these examples like if Google were still serving content in China, think about the snippet build. Does everybody know how snippet view works? Snippet view is an agreement um, with, that Google has, and I'm, I may state this somewhat incorrectly according to the latest terms of the sell, settlement, but essentially they can display up to 20% of a book as little snippets when you search. And think about what determines that 20%. For example, if you searched for Tiananmen Square in China, would you get the same 20% as you would in the US? And I, I actually hold this to be an argument not just for not using the cloud, but for having your own copy so that you have uh, ground truth. And you know, furthermore, we have things like Amazon's Kindle, right, which the Authors Guild has exerted control over because it's a market that where they, they turned off for the vast majority of books text to speech. Now the Kindle was already hard to use if you're blind, right? But it offered one avenue where you could buy into Amazon's library and listen to books. And now the Authors Guild has forced that technology disabled uh, to be disabled, and I think that's just crazy. And you know, the other thing is why are, why is it that we're going through all of these cloud services when they've proven that they will delete things? You know, why why is it that we're buying all these pocket libraries of Alexandria that are going to burn? You know, the moment Amazon turns off its servers, or the moment Apple's new iPad, you know, when you when you buy books on it, they'll probably need to be authorized, just like with the iTunes Store. You transfer them to a different device. Are they going to work or not? You have to trust Apple. So what what I find so maddening is like paper books, by virtue of their existence, by virtue of their physical structure, have all these benefits, right? And actually, that's the same thing that most people who love paper books say. They're like, I love the smell. I like to hold it. I like to read it in the bathtub. And I do too, right? And what's so funny, there's a, there's a mild irony there, which is that as they get older and their eyes get bad, they'll probably need the scalable fonts on an e-reader. But um, you know, no paper book prevents anybody from writing in it, pressing flowers in it, passing it to a friend. No paper book can be remotely disabled. No paper book needs to be turned off on the runway. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, no paper book connects to the internet and by extension to social networks. No paper book can be freely and infinitely copied and updated. And updated, I think, is an important point when you think about textbook editions. No paper book can, be, can easily collect meta and usage data about where it's read and how the person was feeling while they're reading it. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is while the paper book has all these advantages due to the physical substrate that it's printed on, electronic books enjoy none of this yet, right? How many electronic books can you write in? How many electronic books can you highlight? How many electronic books can you loan to a friend? And what, what's so crazy there is when you think about, I sort of missed my slides there while I was going off. Um, Think about the dichotomy of pirates versus publishers in light of what I just said, right? So contrary to the actions of publishers, no pirate will prevent you from copying a book, no pirate will prevent the blind from listening to an audio book, and no pirate will ever delete your digital book. And also, this is a, a crazy point, but I just want to make the point that if we don't extend copyright law into infinity, at some point, pirate works will contribute to the public domain. But pirates versus publishers is a false dichotomy that's being, that's being forced on us throughout this discussion. It's a, something that's arisen out of the discussion. Um, there, there are other options, and I hope that my project shows that there's one of them, that the missing link between the bookshelf and the Kindle is you. And if you think you're doing, if you think everyone else is doing it wrong, I suggest you do it yourself. That's my talk. Sure, here. All right. silly question, but why is it that a uh, photocopier can't do things that, that this can do? The, the issue with the photocopier is that um, they, by virtue of binarizing, 
what's there, in other words, making it purely black and purely white, uh -huh. the details of handwriting are preserved. And the books themselves, when they're wet, stick to the platen surface, so you lift them off and... Approximately how many pages a minute? So, the, the, we discuss this often in the forums. Uh, if you move quickly, I mean, this one, if I press the button, captures everything in about one and a half seconds, 1,700 milliseconds or something. So you can do a lot of pages. 400 pages an hour is a reasonable number, you know, because you've got to, like, use the bathroom and you might miss a page or whatever. Yeah? How much of this space does it take up and you convert it to... It's, it's purely format dependent. So uh, as raw images, an average book takes about two gigabytes, you know, because they're just camera images, right? So you're talking 400 8 megapixel images, 200 to 400 megabytes. If you save them as a PDF um, using different kinds of compression, you can get that down to 100. If you save it with OCR, you could be down to kilobytes, right? It's just, that's an output question. This is an input question. Yeah? Right, so um, I'm not a digitization expert, although I talk to a lot of them. Um, so take this with a grain of salt. Most libraries pursue these, the, the commercial versions of this type of machine. They're called face-up scanners, generally. And the um, Atiz is one major manufacturer. They're, as I said, in the range of 10 grand. And A-T-I-Z. Um, and essentially, they'll get somebody who's, a, you know, who's like a, got a master's degree in that to operate the thing and turn the pages and click. It's what the Internet, the Internet Archive um, built their own scanners, actually. They were the first uh, organization to build their own. They called it the Scribe. Um, and if you Google Internet Archive Scribe, you can see it. It's quite a monstrous contraption. But uh, yeah, generally that's the way they go. Um, they, the metadata and everything else, there's an unbelievable morass of systems out there. Content DM, as far as I understand, is the most widely used database. It's open source, but I think it costs money. You know, so libraries have to deal with metadata, and we don't really deal with metadata yet. Sorry. Yeah. Talking about options of how to encourage people, library patrons, to digitize the books, you didn't suggest to replace the copier with one of those readers. And in exchange for a copy of a few pages that you need, you have to digitize the book, and then it would get printed off of the that's, that's very interesting, and the only, um, I mean, the reason I didn't suggest the, the user actually getting a copy, um, because I agree with you, like, actually, my, in, I've never discussed this idea with anyone, but my idea would be that there would be a central server, and anytime somebody scanned a page, or, you know, a distributed server, whatever, these, these pages would go there for storage, right? And when they fell out of copyright, they'd become accessible. And in the meantime, if you had a fair use like that, maybe you could just get them from the server. And so, sure, there would be a scanner and a printer or a scanner and a copier. I think it's a great idea. I was talking actually about something a little different. I was okay. talking about if you, the, the only reason for the copy machines in a library, I assume, is because the patrons want a few copies, few pa uh, copies right. some, a few pages. Some small of, section, right? Three pages, whatever. Mm -hmm. the book. So it, it, that if they replace the uh, printers, um, copiers with uh, scanners, then in exchange for getting those few pages, the way you get them is you have to scan the whole ah, book sure. and then you get a free three pages or five pages or ten pages. It's a great idea. In the first place. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. So you said that it takes about an hour to scan 400 pages. So that's about two books in an hour. I was just thinking about three years ago, I uh, ripped all my CDs to MP3s and it takes about what, six minutes mm -hmm. to rip one CD. I can, and you can do other things while the uh, CD driver is ripping that. Now you got, well, two books that's half an hour for a book and uh, you have to concentrate and uh, turn, turn pages. Is that really worth it? If you think about uh, Amazon sells books for it. What, twelve dollars? So you're actually not paying for the book, but for the freedom to do whatever you want with your book. That's yeah. That's that's accurate. Thought about that. Yeah, I mean, having scanned a load of books, yeah, I've, I've thought about it. Uh, it's a, it's a really great question. So there are a few things like, if you can buy a nice digital edition that isn't, for example, laden with DRM or otherwise restricting you, I don't I don't see any reason why you why you wouldn't, right? I mean, except that. A, a vast majority of books aren't even yet available that way. 
And so, like, in, in my case, I have a load of optics books from the 60s that I purchased via Amazon. But there, there aren't digital editions. And so, to have those with me, I have to scan them. Now, also remember, the, I think one of the key points of why uh, situations where this technology is really sort of useful is where there isn't, there isn't a market or there isn't a way to get it. So, right after I, well, not tomorrow anyway, I'm leaving for the far north of Ontario to work with a project called the uh, On Demand Book Service. And the intention is in these small First Nations communities in the far north of Ontario where you have to sort of fly in, they might get one book that they need to teach a whole class or something. You can't just order them when you need them, right? You, it's got to get there. So the idea would be to allow them with a, with a book scanner and a binding machine to produce their own books on site. There are many, many situations in which scanning a book in this fashion makes sense. As far as like getting the latest J.K. Rowling or something, no, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Except that, by the way, she said she'll never make digital editions, which ensured that her books became digital editions. I would have a different response to that. I would say I object to being forced to pay for the same information twice. Right. I object to being, I, like the friend of his that has 3,000, 4,000 science fiction books, I probably have a third or a half that many. Uh, but more important to me, I have textbooks from when I was in college and in graduate school. I have computer language books and so on, and I don't, those things, $40, $50 a crack, minimum, I'm not going to go out and pay another $40 or $50 just so I can carry the information around in a portable fashion. That I, I object to that in a philosophical sense. That kind of book I would definitely scan. And, you know, if, if it sticks in your craw enough, then it's worth it to you. It's not just to carry around. Here, 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 here. Let's be searchable. Here, here. Yes. There's a good spirit in it. I like this. I guess it's just a question of how it's much what's, you put, how much, put value to yes. your own work. To your own work, to your own effort, and to your own time, yes. Have you ever just like said, I'm going to just cut the spine on this book because my time's not worth the amount it would take to do it on a... If I had a scanner that would do that, I would think about it. But I do also like the physical holding of a book. I, you know, I, I'm not going to bring my laptop in the bathtub with me. I'm sorry. That's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I might consider a little swing arm for the video display. But... You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to, I have emotional attachments to the things. I, Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, this first science fiction book I can never remember reading. I read when I was in seventh or eighth grade and I still have that copy. And it is dog-eared and worn and I hope to God I never have to buy another one. Okay, because I want that book. I think that's a really important point too, is that many, many books are personalized. Right. You got this book from somebody, it's got their signature at the top. You can't buy that from Amazon. Mm -hmm. Do you have any incidents with lawyers with regard to copyright? <laughs> um, since we're being webcast, right here, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about some of that later. Okay, um, the, basic, the basic idea is that, um, as I understand the legal issue, some people may interpret my teaching people to build book scanners as inducing copyright infringement. And that, I know, I know, it's tenuous, it makes me frown too. Um, but unfortunately, that, that, has, that is a problem. Another issue, um, which may or may not have come up, is that I'm a graduate student uh, at a university, and sometimes universities feel that they have ownership over things ma that students make. Happy to talk about that later. Have people in your community started sharing books with each other? And no. So we uh, there, so right. I mean, why would you? A definitive answer for something that can't possibly be true. Within your community, I, I, I take yeah within exactly. Within your forum, I agree. There are, there are no books. Okay, so let me let me let me restate that answer. So uh, on instructables.com for the original instructable, I scanned a U.S. Navy handbook on how to use hand tools because I figured there would be people who want a book scanner who have never you know don't have the skills right. So I scanned this public domain book and put it up with the instructable. It's not there anymore, mostly because it was kind of poor quality and it was made with that garbage scanner. So everybody was like, give me this crap. Why would I make this if the quality sucks? But uh, what I'm saying is that there have been, um, or in the forum, for example, when people have problems with a specific page of a book, 
sometimes they'll post that page to see what the issue was with the software or something. You know, we're not in the in the business of distribution, right? I, I kind of suspect that the people that contact me privately via email who don't share their designs in the forum might have other uses for their scanners. But I, are on the, the people that I work with by and large are really the stories that I told you plus people just scanning their collections. And I would also, I would also say that um, the, the discussion on the forum is about the scanner and the creation, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to suggest that the forum had become a, a, a center of trading. I just right. to suggest that. Right. That, the, that, the that forum, it was the, the fact that others who were using the information gathered in the forum probably were digitizing information that they were sharing. Was, that, that seems a likely occurrence. Now, on the other hand, uh, if you accidentally search Google for, say, O'Reilly books or something, um, you'll find, by and large, and O'Reilly Books is a poor example because they actually do sell nice PDFs, right? But there are other publishers where you can actually, the majority of books you'll find have not been scanned. They're leaked preprints with crop marks and everything on them, right? They're not coming from scanners. And I think that's an important point to make. Well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, well, now I just lost it. Publishes. Um, um, how many people are contributing to? I mean, presumably, a lot of people on your forum are there for support or to work things out. How yeah. many people there are contributing to the design, either the software or the well, the, the hardware. Okay, so I I view um, just a couple answers to that question. I view these these you know, and again, these are not all by any means, but these forty some different designs actually as a kind of distributed proofing of all these. I mean, like, there's a right. scanner made of styrofoam, right? And that's actually a contribution because we know yeah. it can be made that way. And that, that guy, by the way, actually gave a talk on it, too, in Berlin, which I was very happy about. Sure. Um, here's, you know, this guy, I don't know if you can see, but there are skateboard wheels running the platen. And so, in a way, um, the designs have been proofed. And I'm trying to apply that right now. Let's see if I can make this come up. Um, I don't know. The scanner was on the front of the CBC today, but nobody. Uh, but the article wasn't about the scanner. Um, okay, I, I don't know if I'll get in. Anyway, I'm making a new, what I call the new standard scanner. So people have been working from this old instructable, which is very long and arduous and doesn't reflect all the cool things that people have figured out. So I'm making one that incorporates all that. So that's 40 or so people that have done hardware innovate. Uh, hardware innovate. Make it more like 80. Yeah. 80 people have done hardware stuff. And then presumably in software. Software, the numbers are less. The numbers are less. Much less. Um, uh, Rob, the original founder, made a page post processor. Aaron, my friend, made a page post, pro post processor. Um, a guy named Spamsicle made one. There was a bunch of uh, sort of scattering immediately. And then we found Scantailer. And it worked so well. I mean, it was just like a revelation. Right. And from there, the problem is that ScanTailor is such a crazy piece of software that it's taking these guys time right. to get into it. And so just now we're seeing the de-warping and those things happening with the cooperation of the original author. And, and how much of this stuff do you think, um, I, don't, I don't know how well you know the commercial uh, alternatives, but uh, I mean, how, how much of the, the stuff that's up here um, are the kinds of things you, people, you, you know, you, you'd find in the commercial ones? I, yeah, I guess I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, the the hardware design is, you know, you have a V-shaped piece of glass and lights and cameras. It's really, you know, no mystery. Um, the the software side is totally different, though. Right. Like in our case, you unload the cameras and you feed the Im the images into ScanTailor, and you know. But there are like like a tease uses I think it's called Cofax VRS is their image ingestion system, and it does stuff, and I don't know what it is because I can't afford it. I, I wouldn't buy it anyway. I mean, and, and then, uh, yeah. question. Are you using CHDK on the cameras? I know yeah, it's camera. actually SDM. So okay. a very so CHDK is a is a hacked firmware for PowerShot cameras, and it was one of the tricks that made this thing go. So now when the cameras they see a little pulse on the USB port and they fire at the same time, that was one of the original beautiful things. And there's a guy named David Sykes who ported the original camera hack to do stereo photography, which this is pretty close to stereo photography. And that's how we get. That's how we achieve that. Awesome. So then, let me pose. <coughs> it has to do with your view of fair use. Uh, when I'm when I'm listening to where you're seeing the legal line, you're imagining someone with a science fiction collection who has a. Uh, 
personal desire to have some piece of it in a digital format and <coughs> engages in a form of self-help with one of your scanners to digitize it. And the question there is that copying an infringement of the copyright or is that a fair use? And it's your assertion that that's a fair use. That's right. Now, do you think that, I don't know, I put it to the crowd. Does that stand up? It's the same question if you rip your CD to put it in your iPod. I mean, nobody's really tested that, and I don't think the, the copyright owners really want that test because it's way too close to Betamax, I think. They may not have tested that exact thing, but have they tested, for example, copying vinyl to cassette, something much older? Mm. Same thing. Well, I think that that's something that the copyright holders have wanted to avoid yeah. because they claim that that would be a violation, but nobody's ever taken it to the court because I think there's a good chance that it isn't. I think you probably have a fair use right to change the format of, of something you own. I, I would be more concerned about the market claim fair use principles. Isn't there some, one of the principles is that you're infringing on somebody's market by... It's one of the factors. One of the factors. One of, one of the four possible... Yeah. So yeah. That, that's a negative factor. I can't sell you the same thing you've already bought yet again. Yeah. You can convert it yourself. But there's, there's four factors, and I think that it is very likely that it would be hard for a court to say, gee, you bought that CD and you downloaded it to your iPod, you've just committed a copyright infringement because that's not a fair use. I think that would be extremely hard. And I think that if somebody did, I think Congress might actually react to that. So I think that as long as, I mean, I, I built a scanner to, to scan a microfilm I had. Because mm. I didn't have a microfilm mm -hmm. uh, uh, reader, but I had a computer. So I just scanned this microfilm. And, you know, it's 1940s. I don't think anybody wants to assert copyright, but clearly it's theoretically could be within copyright. I don't consider that to be anything but fair use. I want to look at it on my computer, which is easy. Um, I don't think it's been tested, but I think that it would be very hard uh, if that weren't fair use. I think one one thing that sort of bothers me, right, is I'm on the internet, and, you know, there was the CBC or whatever a moment ago. Um, it looks like the page actually came up. And, you know, the, I, I think, actually, I think Lessig talked about this recently, but along these lines, like, I had to download this picture to view it, and so I've copied it. And once, once we get into these kind of further ends of copying, it all, doesn't it just break into nonsense? I mean, I, I, have, I don't know how copyright law works in this circumstance. Well, you probably right? have, a, you have a license to look at that web page by the fact of them putting it up there, most likely. Even if, even if I buy some uh, pre-digitized music and get a copy of that legally on my hard drive, I might need to make a copy of it into the memory of the computer to play it. Yeah, and that, that's a copy. I mean, there's there's a court case that says converting it from the disk into your memory is making a copy and violates copyright right. infringement. I mean, the problem is the courts have had a lot, very hard time dealing with electronic issues. It was really easy when there was a book, and if you scanned the book and gave it to, you know, copied the book and gave it to somebody, it, yes. that was easy. Now it gets very, very complicated. And yet there was a recent decision having to do with centralized TiVos where it wasn't a copy. You know, but I don't, I don't think that's really the issue here. The issue is I think that as long as you're digitizing your personal collection so that you can dump it to your Kindle or read it in the bathroom on your articulated monitor, you're probably not much at risk. All right, so now take the next step. Here we've now got a world of people who digitize their books with this explosive phenomenon of a uh, scanner that makes it so easy to do. And then you get David's question. Do we imagine somehow that this distributed archive of scan the digital open bits is not going to be aggregated by someone? Well, that's not the question. Of course it will be. The question is, is that legal? And the prob answer is probably no. I mean, remember that somebody had that great set where as long as you had the CD, they would store it on their server? This this was back in pre-Napster. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. that was the concept, and they that didn't nailed. fly. Yeah. Uh, except... Unless, of course, you're whatever the people with the digitized TiVo is, where suddenly they got away with it because they're doing exactly I mean, the same thing. But it, this gets down to what is copyright. I mean, you say it didn't fly, and it's perfectly true it didn't fly. The court came along and hit the company for, I don't know, $50 million. It was one of the most outrageous things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was amazing. So if what we're trying to say is what do we expect 
this power nexus that expresses itself through courts to say that's one thing but if on the other hand we're saying what would be some kind of reasonable way of organizing the way bits are going to work in a free space then it's a very different question actually my point was slightly different which was this little guy got trounced but when the big cable company did it they got away with it now maybe it was because they had better lawyers but essentially they were both doing the same thing which is they were using a centralized server to store material that the end user had proof of right to view no so, they they stored separate copies for each viewer see yeah. that's but see that i think is really interesting right because there's a seller's privilege here i mean does anybody think that amazon stocks you know 12 million copies of whatever ebook they're selling no, they must have one file which they're copying out, and so in a way, there's kind of a seller's privilege there. That's implicit, technologically speaking. They're paying a license, though, for each copy. I mean, they, ultimately, I mean, with Charlie, Charlie, I think you're going for a different norm. The question is, certainly, if someone could show they have a copy of the book that somebody else has digitized, you know, I think they have a right to download the digital copy. I mean, you know, they've got right to that. I'm not sure if that's where you're going or if you're just, I mean, if you're going back to because there's no digital copy of it, everybody should have a right to it, whether they've licensed it or not. And I have some argument with you on that issue. But certainly, if I have a copy of the Heinland book and you've digitized it, I should be able to copy the digitized from you as long as I can show that, look, I, I bought that thing for 25 cents, you know, having at the, at the local, uh, you know, book fair. Um, and in fact, I've done that. I've downloaded material that I have because I was too lazy to digitize it myself. And while I think legally that's, there's an argument that it's a copyright violation, I think it would be very hard right. to win on it. That's an excellent uh, point. I had a CD not too long ago. I ripped one of the songs was scratched. I could not get a good image of it. I downloaded that song off the internet. I felt that that was fair because I owned a copy of it. And I think one thing Charlie's pointing is there's a real schism between what the law says is fair and legal and what they're going to hit you. In fact, there's a horrible decision that says um, if there's a, a disc somewhere that's copywritten, that has a copyright on it, you can't even get the reduced penalties because it's somewhere it's protected. And what people think is reasonable. Um, there was a very funny description of a news service, I think on Lifehacker today, of someone where you send them all your CDs they send you back electronic companies, and then they send them off to the third world. And there was this discussion about whether that was legal or not. And a bunch of people said, of course it was. I bought it, so I can do whatever I want with it. So I mean, I think that there's a real lack of understanding of what the law is. But there's also a normative question of what should people's rights be. But I mean, effectively, that reduces the physical book to a token of, I mean, it's just like, well, then why don't I just buy like, you know, little wooden coins that say that I own Highline? Right, I mean, well, but that's the issue. The issue is, should the original creator be compensated or not? I mean, and as long as you have a token that says the original creator has been compensated, then you should get have access to the material. But then, how would it work? I can borrow you. I, you can lend me any book you have, right? For as long as you want. Absolutely. Well, then you should be able to lend me a digital copy of your book as well. Without... As long as I don't keep the original, I don't see any problem with that. Well, well see, that's totally. weird. <laughs> but the question is, yeah, I mean, it all comes back to how do we compensate creators, and maybe as as you know, uh, See, Professor they, Fisher they, says, they go along. Uh, <laughs> the, the problem like is they didn't think about it. Like uh, well, they, but don't, they, don't even, they don't even have to produce rational things. They can produce outcomes that are so screamingly irrational that we look at them and we all know that they're just ridiculously excessive. Right, and yet we have a Congress so that hasn't a addressed it. Thing that you're up against on the other side. Well, no, but we have a Congress that has given them the tools for these irrational no, results. No, no, Congress just keeps back in the month. Well, that's giving them the tools. I mean, Congress could no. fix it in a stroke of a pen. But I mean, when somebody gets hit with twenty-seven thousand, a fourteen-year-old gets hit with a twenty-seven thousand dollar fine, um, you know, because a, a circuit court says, well, you know, somewhere there was a disc with a copyright on it. I mean, if that's not crazy and nobody does anything about it, then you got to wonder what Congress is up to, so, except for collecting checks. But I mean, isn't it isn't it funny though? Sorry. I Love Sorry, we got I, mean, I was just going to say, isn't it funny that like uh, author compensation is the least of all this new book technology? I mean, really? 
I think that's bizarre. I actually, I think that right now we have this sort of Catholic model, right? There's the there's we, you've got somebody in between you and God. Who I'm going to say is the author, and like we, I would like to see that guy removed, and we pay the authors directly, right? We're not we don't need printing presses and trucks and all this stuff anymore, and yet for whatever reason, uh, the majority of authors who have spoken up have sided with the Authors Guild, or I should say, I shouldn't say a majority because I don't know that number, but many, and the Authors Guild themselves are you know. Turn, doing things like turning off the Kindle and stuff, and yet there's still, there's a moral um, platitude being put out there that we must pay the author. I agree, but it's not part of this new technology, and that's wacky. Um, my question was just, is there a legal distinction between scanning a book as an image and just leaving it as a PDF and converting it to OCR and then well, allowing it to be searchable, that sort of thing? It seems like just scanning it as an image is basically a photocopy, and you, you can make copies of it easily, but it's, you, you know, you're not really changing the format of it, but using OCR, suddenly you have the data in, in, in truly. Did, did in Google make that argument, that converting it into an index through OCR was fair use, it was a transformative work? But it's kind of weird, right? It, it started out as digital text, probably, and then it, right. you make it into digital text, and now you've added value or been transformative? I'm not sure. Transformative. Sorry, I mean, it? It's a copy either way. So it's not about whether it's a copy, it's about whether there's a fair use right to make that copy. And, you know, one of the issues is whether it's transformative or not. I mean, to the extent that a photocopy is no different than the original work, it's probably less transformative. But it is very interesting because it does differentiate usage. And so you could imagine uh, some market drawing a line. I mean, that's. that's very interesting what you say because you have to imagine the idea of copying them as in terms of the differences among formats. I mean, if I were to scan my books, I wouldn't just want PDFs, right? I, I, I want to search them. I want to mm. run all sorts of analyses mm -hmm. on them. Well, the PDF, lots of cool stuff PDF should actually. have underlined text. Yeah, if you do it right. You, you, yeah, depending fact, on how you do it. The default for Adobe is. When you scan, it's to OCR. And this actually got a pretty good, the latest version is pretty good on its OCR. The, I mean, but I think that's a really important point that's totally lost again in all this discussion. It's actually the most, the, what's, what will be reading books most in the future will be computers and not humans. Because, I mean, that's, what, that's exactly what Google's doing with them, right? They're going to train their translation engines on them, you know, and all these different things. It's these quote unquote non screen uses that are going to dominate. And that's another thing that is basically ignored in the public discourse. It's like, well, authors got to get paid, so publishers got to get paid, but who's doing the reading? And I just think it's interesting. For me, that's the only exciting thing about reading electronically. Reading on a screen is no fun. I'd much rather have a book. The only reason I prefer a screen is so I can do the things that I can't do with the data. Um, so I mean, in continuing my worldwide acknowledgement of copyright infringement. When I was in law school, I had yay books this heavy, and I would copy the stuff we were going to do at home on my home just copy machine and bring the copies in because I didn't want to drag books back and forth. And I considered that a pure, perfectly fair use. This would have been a much nicer way of doing it. But I think that there's tons of fair use applications of this, so I think it fits dead into the Betamax exception. And I don't see how anybody could claim um, you know, that didn't have fair use or, or legal rights. So I don't know if you get, you know, how, how likely somebody is to win on a claim that it's uh, contributory. This is a fairly new field, and uh, we've seen a lot of action, also commercial action, you know, book scanning. So have you run into patents? Is this a field that begins with patents? Um, so patents aren't, they're not too bad actually. The majority of patents are on the, that remain are on things like page turning mechanisms and stuff that's just too complicated for any individual to produce. I don't know the software patent world at all. Um, it seems to me like we're probably going to come up on a bunch of software patents relating to ebook reading technology, but I, I don't have a good idea that's spread. I mean, to me, the major bad thing about the ebook industry as it stands is that the books that they're selling don't enjoy the benefits of their medium, as I was saying. You know, it's like you get these books that you can't annotate. You get books that you can't have read back to you, that you can't copy for your friends. Sort of, we're getting these really broken product at the beginning, and, and the really bad thing is that people will get normalized to, the, to that being the expectation of what a digital book is. 
So. I'm not convinced that's the case. I, mean, I think that what we're seeing with digital music is that you know you had a lot of control over formats. You had a lot, you know, the you know the central control of iTunes was um, draconian, but in many ways it was required to get to <coughs> labels over the hump of let's make this stuff available, and then over time that, you know, a lot of those things have changed. And so if you ultimately don't appreciate the licensing you know, rules of iTunes, then buy, buy from Amazon or buy from some other source. And the other the other reality is that, you know, there will always be people who prefer time to money, who have more time than money, or people have more money than time. And, the people, and so, you know, there will be people who will happily pay whatever it takes to not have to flip a bunch of pages and, and scan their own book and that over I time and over time the, the price will get smaller the controls will get will get smaller and that gap will get you know will will de de decrease but so, i mean the subtext of your argument though is that we need to submit to more control no to no, get to I'm just saying i don't agree with your conclusion I, you don't have to submit to anything i'm just saying that over time as demand as demand increases for these for our digital products then there will be a marketplace that will cause you know someone to differentiate based on licensing terms, differentiate based on formats, and that will cause innovation, which will ultimately lead to a better product. That's... I have to disagree a little bit because people seem to put up with having to watch the FBI warning on DVDs <laughs> over and over and over again because they can't fast forward past it. And if people weren't normalized to that, they would say, "Wait, I could do that with my VCR," and they would all boycott it. But you know, well, people accept in, it. In, in fairness, um, uh, uh, almost every um, free or open source software uh, DVD player allows you to pass code. I absolutely, yeah, yes, and, yeah, you can uh, turn off and, the OP flags on those. you're watching it on a computer, you're doing, you know, you're Right, but, but the truth but is... Most computers, you have to be using one of the free players. But the market has not reacted to... I mean, there hasn't been an uproar right. such that the, the reacted has said, gee, maybe people don't have to watch... We, we, in fact, it's gotten worse. On Blu-ray, you now have are forced to watch the previews. And yet, there doesn't seem to be a. I think I think I, I don't yeah. think I'm, I don't think I'm disagreeing with you. I think right. that what I'm I think that what I'm suggesting is that is that what's happened is, is that there's a community of people who basically figured out how to get around this. They built their own players and they've modified existing players. Very so tiny. And 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 even though what they're doing is vi almost certainly violating some sort of license or, or, or some sort of deal, for, perhaps on the DVD player, who knows? Um, um, the, the, as long as it's a small enough community of sort of uh, I don't know movies, lead users, or whoever that that basically the the the, the powers that we are but having. Don't right, but I'm, we, I'm we, arguing yeah. about we, we've come, become normalized to being told what we can and cannot do with our media. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that there's there's always this argument, right? Like, on, on if you buy an iPhone and you fill it with iTunes music or whatever, well, you can crack it. You can run your own. You can run City or whatever the alternative app stores and stuff. You know, like, I went the hardcore way and I bought the Linux phone, right? Well, it turns out that, like, ten people in the world have this phone and nobody does anything with it. And, you know, like... It's a great, I love this phone, but it's sorry. It's not practical like the iPhone. And I, I just think that that approach is not, it's definitely not optimal, right? It's like, okay, well, sure, we can overcome. But that sucks. I mean, why wouldn't, you know, if publishers have spent all the money uh, making ebooks such an unbelievably advantageous product that we'd buy them outright? I mean, like, why don't ebooks show us things we've never seen before? Like, for example, the Ben Fry recently did this project. Let's see if I can pull it up. It's amazing. Um, ben Fry, Darwin. Um, so what he did is he took Darwin's Origin of Species across six editions and showed the passage of different, let's see if this will load, the passage of different phrases throughout the book. So you actually get to watch the evolution of Darwin's ideas visually. This is an idea for a, an ebook sort of situation where the ebook has advantages that a scanner could never give you. Or imagine that a publisher could show you the hand of the editor, which is something that's been forever opaque to end users. Or there could be an author's cut of a book. And why aren't they doing that? Yeah, They're investing their money in all this awful crap that just makes things hard for people. I, I think that there's a much better way to approach this problem, which is to make their product incontrovert, as you're sort of saying, that the licensing and product is so awesome that I can't help but buy it. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I have Jonathan's Vitrain book sitting in my, my house. As I got ready to get on the plane to come here, I bought it on my Kindle, right? So I could have built a scanner and scanned, you know, well, scanned it and it turned out. Huh? It's available free online. Well, well I'm an idiot. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> but it is available free online, so you don't have to but, scan but, it. But, you know, but whatever, you know, whatever, 
you know, ultimately, but again, this is a, I'm not an idiot because ultimately 10 bucks of my time, it took me literally two seconds. And so, but you know, how do I value my time? I value my time. So, and did I, you know, would I have liked to annotate it maybe or had it on my laptop or on, you know, whatever, maybe, but ultimately, you know, so why, why do we, why do we endure that FBI warning? You know, because who cares? It's just not enough of an inconvenience for enough of us to, to kick, right? If it was, if, if, if it came up every, uh, you know, 15 minutes, I think that there would be, that there would be a reaction to that, right? Mm -hmm. That's the a problem. aggregate, right? The social cost. The social aggregate. cost is how many, How many, uh, you know, millions of hours have we spent watching the same FBI? <laughs> uh, like, That's a great know, question. Actually, it's, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll do some. It's all the It's only water torture. <laughs> 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 Format that took away a freedom we had previously. Yeah, sure. That really was it. Sure. When I yeah. saw my first DVD, I thought this format will never catch on because I could fast forward before. I, mean, I, I can't. That's what surprised made me. The same observation. But I was wrong because apparently if you're just on a tight day like that. Well, it can fast forward on a DVD. It's not as fast sometimes. Well, no, they disable. There's something called operator flags, and they yeah. disable fast forward. Oh, on the on the on the FBI yeah. warning. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now they disable it on the previews. Quite extraordinary. Well, it's mostly yeah. on Blu ray. So you actually, it takes you 10 minutes to get to the content. You can rip, the, I mean, I can rip the content and see it, or I can play it on a player, but I'd like to be able to watch it on my big screen. I'd rather not have to spend 40 minutes ripping the thing and disabling it, but I can't get enough people upset about it to change the market. Uh, part of the problem is the standards keep changing. I mean, there's no agreement about what is the ebook standard. You've got PDF, but See, I can a lot of governments now are saying that it's not, it's it's not open source, so they're not using it. So, you know, there's all these different formats, and you know, if you're not a Mac person, and you know, like, yeah. why, why do you want to go into the iTunes thing? I know you can have iTunes on Windows. Yeah, but, it's awful though. But so it's like, what standard are we going to write the the laws for? Is is iTunes going to be the standard, or now now things are going for? XML, you know, open doc formats. I guess, but do, do we, do, you know, is it necessary to tie it intimately with the actual structure of the bits, or is it better to that the law gives you guidelines that sort of say it's got to be this open, or you can't restrict something in this way, well, it's, or it's it also, can only be restricted in this way? It's also what, what the, the format can do, adding extra value, searchability and stuff like that. I mean, who knows what, nobody <coughs> I mean, keeps you know, jamming in so much stuff into the PDF format. And, you know, I mean, the freaking thing plays movies now. I yeah, mean, it's just, 3D models, yeah. Well, I, I remember it was like it's just like a little meg download for the reader, and now it's ridiculous. But, yeah. but, but who's going to be the standard? And, and now that they're not making an open source, you know, so how so do you dictate? You're right, I, but I think there, and this is just my approach to everything, I guess. I'm kind of a one-trick pony, but the, you know, I would say, like, if you were... Um, Open source programmers, you could make an ebook format that was so incontrovertibly better than everything else. You know, like it supported all the features that everybody wants. Then that would have some chance of adoption. Although uh, there is Deja Vu, which is actually in many ways much better than PDF and is totally ignored. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess that's all. I, that's all I could say about that. Well, I mean, the problem though is that um, right now the publishing industry is like the music industry you know, couldn't get a talk together about the formats. So Napster was born, and everyone just said, well, if you're not going to decide, we're going to, you know, they, they, they kind of, everyone kind of agreed that MP3 is going to be the way we're going to go. And then meanwhile, you know, Rome is burning while they wouldn't decide on how they're going to distribute music, and now it's, it's, it's crazy. And now the same thing is happening with the movie industry and, and now publishing. You know, no one's making a decision, so people are just saying, well, screw you, we're just going to do it our ourselves, and, you know. Yeah. You think that in some way what's needed is a decision? But they can't really decide because, uh, I'm going to contradict myself, but um, we don't, we haven't really uh, agreed upon a common format, you know, what, how things are going to be distributed. Um, and I think that that's part of the problem because they don't know how to they don't know how to write laws for or how to uh, uh, you know uh, decide what's fair use with with certain formats. Um, maybe I didn't answer your question. Um, I just think that right now there's so much stuff up in the air that they just don't know how to you know 
how to decide. And, and it's kind of funny watching you know, these kinds of projects come together because, you know, they're, okay, we're not going to write for you. And, you know, and it's, there's a lot of books, a lot of information that's not available <coughs> in digital format. And there's a lot of, um, you know, information out there that, that, you know, would really be helpful if it was distributed. And now with the internet around the world, I mean, you know, you can get things into the, into the hands of people that you know, can really do some good. But if there's a digital version, I'm not saying we should pirate, but... <laughs> it, I mean, it do, the technology does seem to suggest all kinds of great outcomes that yeah. are currently not possible. Or not legal. I have a couple of quick technical questions. Um, are those cameras still available? Are they still 89 bucks at a... No. Um, <laughs> I bought them last year, about this time. Uh, there are new models. Um, SX, I'm going to say them on the camera. SX200 and A1000 seem to be the best. You okay. need to find ones that support the cracked firmware. Or that, not okay. cracked, that the custom firmware. There's no okay. cracking involved. I was able to find 590, A590s on eBay that were labeled as broken. Primarily because the flash didn't work. Which, would yes, and which I got doesn't matter. And 50, 60 yeah. bucks a piece. Yeah. Since I'm providing my own light, I don't care about the flash. They sometimes show up in refurbished outlets, too. Like, they've been available seven or eight times for 89 bucks over the last year. Does, does the other firmware allow you to or support minimizing the EXIF data that, to depersonalize it, if you wish? No, but um, um, the, the EXIF the data is not preserved through the scanning process. They're not preserved anyway. No. Okay. Well, Daniel, thank you very much. Thank awesome. you. Thank you.